God is trusting us to be the treasure. God is trusting you to be the treasure. God is trusting your church to be the treasure. God is trusting us to be the treasure. As preposterous as that may sound, as unjustifiable as that may be, this is where all discipleship begins. It begins with Jesus' call to a ragtag crew of ordinary people, follow me. Jesus trusts that with all their limitations, with all their foibles, amidst their disagreements and squabbles, Jesus trusts that their witness will not only be sufficient, it will initiate the greatest mass movement the world has ever seen. It continues when Jesus tells Peter that he will be the rock on which Jesus will build his church. Yes, Peter, the one whose insecurity and confusion would lead to outright betrayal, not once, but three times. Jesus trusts Peter to build his church. And it continues when Jesus appears to a bloodthirsty Saul as he approaches Damascus. And defying all logic and expectation, Jesus trusts this infamous persecutor of Jesus' followers. Is there anyone here who thinks that the nincompoops we know as the original disciples, or for that matter, Peter or Paul, is there anyone here who thinks that they merited Jesus' trust? Of course not. Like us, they were clay jars, fragile, easily broken, delicate, and vulnerable. And it is because of these qualities that God trusts them and invests in them God's extraordinary power. And by receiving God's power, these hapless disciples courageously initiated such transformation as the world had never seen. So imagine that their story might become our story. Imagine that we too are invited to live into the dynamics Paul describes. When you know in your bones that God is trusting you, you can be afflicted, but you will not be crushed. When you accept that God is counting on you, you can be perplexed, but you will not be driven to despair. When you experience the assurance that God has chosen you, you will be sustained through any and all persecution. When you are standing up for the justice God calls us to make real, though you may be struck down, you will not be destroyed. Living as we are in a time of deep dislocation, we need to hear this assurance. What do I mean by dislocation? Let's begin with the resolutions we've considered today. Mass incarceration, violence in the name of religion, and a just peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And then there's the issue on which our conference has led the nation, climate change, the most fundamental dislocation in human history. But as churchgoers and as church leaders, we are experiencing dislocation much closer to home. New England is perhaps the least religious area in the nation. The experience of church that has given meaning to so many of us seems to be of little interest to so many others. The buildings 
so many of us associate with our faith have become like millstones around the necks of shrinking congregations. And you know I could go on. In all these ways and more, we are fragile clay jars, easily broken, delicate, vulnerable. And yet, and yet in us, God has invested extraordinary power. If you've been paying attention during this annual meeting, if you've ever attended a Super Saturday, if you read the, e the weekly emailing, if you click around on the conference website, or if you page through the just released annual report, you have a sense of what I'm talking about. But let's face it, if it's true that God has invested in us extraordinary power, then we are called to extend the horizon of hope and to make real God's transformative expectations of love and justice. Let me give three examples of what that would look like. Our former conference board chair, Sally Norris, is not here today because she and her congregation to, are busy making God's love and justice real out on the Cape. Sally is preparing to host tomorrow a public hearing, a panel that will include four local police chiefs and a retired NYPD captain who has a PhD from Union Theological School. They will address the difficult and painful questions brought on by recent tragic national events and lifted up by the Black Lives Matter movement. And they will do this in a way that builds on and strengthens on positive police community relations. Sally also leads the Martin Luther King action team on the Cape. Who knew there was a Martin Luther King action team on the Cape? And this month, they are taking a course on unlearning racism, and three police officers are joining them in taking that course. Now, you all can be involved in my second example. Come to our National Church Leadership Institute on August 10th through 13th. The Mass Conference is co-sponsoring this event from the, for, with the Center for Progressive Renewal, and it will be held at Andover Newton Theological School. Your conference staff and I have traveled to Atlanta over the past few years and experienced this conference, and I guarantee you will discover in it new ways to enhance the vitality of your congregation as you make real God's transformative expectations of love and justice. And you'll get a chance to hear some fabulous speakers, too. And now my third example of extending the horizon of hope concerns the greatest moral challenge the world has ever faced, climate change. Last month, emergent church leader and author Brian McLaren called for a national religious uprising on behalf of the planet. So here is something concrete each of you can do. Make a commitment to stand up for creation by inviting your pastor to become part of what we're calling a new awakening. The ask is simple. Ask your pastor to preach on climate change sometime in the fall. And if you're clergy, just make a personal commitment to do so, even if you've already preached on the climate crisis. The New England Regional Environmental Ministries hopes to get at least 70% of all churches in New England to hear a sermon on climate change sometime in the fall between when the Pope addresses a joint session of Congress toward the end of September and when the, the climate talks convene in early December in, in uh, Paris. Just look for the new awakening phrase on the Mass Conference website. Now these are but three examples of how we are extending the horizon of hope, how we are making real God's transformative expectations of love and justice. And we could add to the many of the stories that we have heard earlier in our gathering during these 
uh, clay jar breakouts. Jesus calls us to step away from the unexamined conformity, low expectations, and limited hope that accompanies us every day. And he invests in us extraordinary power. Our calling is to receive that power so that the vision articulated in the Gospels will become our expectation. This is how we write the future. This is how we shape history, by envisioning new possibilities and acting on them as if they were inevitable. And we're able to do that because we know that God trusts us, that God trusts the church. And we are invited to respond to that trust with all our heart, all our mind, and all our strength. What new personal story will you begin to live out today in response to God's call? What new story will your church begin to live into in the coming year as you respond to God's call? What new story will the Christian church begin to write in response to the imminent collapse of creation? And how will you and your congregation do your part? And what new creation story will humans join in authoring to restore the possibility for creation's vital future. I know it sounds like a tall order, especially when we are all too aware that we are like clay jars. And yet, even as we are fragile, easily broken, delicate, and vulnerable, God trusts us to be the treasure. And because God invests in us extraordinary power, we can live into a new story that exceeds what we can imagine. May it be so for each of us and for our churches and hospitals and schools and communities and all the places we witness and serve. Amen.